Oh, I wish I had a snack. I have some jelly beans, but that's not really enough. Oh, I have mm. some Hershey nuggets. Oh, dude, pass me one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to, like, throw it at my computer screen, but that's not funny on a podcast. No, don't do that. How the hell am I supposed to know what Ralph likes? I'm sorry you don't like context-rich problems, Mikhail. Wait, what? No. Con- context-rich problem? What are you ta- Question 15. Ralph likes 25 but not 24. Oh, Ralph that question. Someone. Yeah, he thinks that's too context-rich, too personal uh-huh. of a connection to Ralph. Who wants to introduce the topic to the listeners? No. <laughs> what? I don't. <laughs> oh, you just don't want to? So we're going to be talking about personality tests at least what i want to talk about is how useful they are i don't think they really mean much i don't think this iq test means much about how smart i am well i mean (laughs) well and i think a big part of it is i i guess you know what are you trying to get out of it and it's never like trying to dictate terms in your life like astrology tends to it's not trying to be a predictor of things that's true it's just kind kind of trying to throw you in a broad group that says you're based on these combination of traits you're more likely to behave like this and more likely to enjoy these sorts of things or whatever that deal is yeah i guess and i guess i kind of use it to think about how i work and the ways that i like to get things done and the ways that i interact with people i guess i treat like the strengths and now the myers briggs stuff as kind of like a way to ground the way that I think about the way that I work on different things and how that's different from other people. And like, you know, like it's okay that I work the way that I work. Um, That's fair. And I can put myself in situations that lend me to doing better. Yeah. I think one issue that I had, what? I'm done. (laughs) What'd you get? 132. I got to say towards the end there, I kind of got bored. Mm Mm-hmm. What did you guys get on the IQ test? Which, but for the listeners, it was 20 questions, which I think is a ridiculous Yeah, measure. it's quite the claim. But I got a, I got 140. I got a 143. Well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whatever. Really good at this. It's really nice to have such a consistent schedule that allows us to get better. <laughs> oh, which, by the way, this definitely isn't going to be edited until, like, middle of june oh i forgot you're going on that trip it's gonna be so fun i'm so excited yeah actually that's kind of why i was late because i went to the midwest mountaineering um outdoor adventure expo okay Mm. i got a rain jacket and um, one of those um, pack covers get some ice picks (laughs) no (laughs) ice climbing I'm, i'm just going hiking dang you you should you should just be one of those super over prepared types no. That just has, like, everything when it makes no sense. Mikhail is one of those overprepared types. I'm not overprepared. I prepared just enough. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> it's very subjective, and your level is much higher than most people's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair. I think that the majority of people are unprepared for so many situations. Yeah. True. Because many situations can't be anticipated properly. It forces you to improv. It's the American way, Mikhail. So another test Wham. that we took was what lightsaber color are you? Oh my gosh. Mark and I both got blue. Yeah. Really? Did you get blue? No, I got purple. Whoa. What? How did mace. you get purple? <laughs> yep, apparently my lightsaber color is purple because it says you use techniques on the light and the dark side. Oh, you're a fence sitter. Yeah, dude. Do you know what that does? It brings balance. Hurts your butt? Makes your balls hurt. Oh, how? <laughs> okay, I like that answer, Bender. Well, Jack and I both got blue because apparently we like some, sometimes engaging in fights and rely on our lightsabers for fighting. I said I wanted to rely on the Force and answered Force for basically every other question. And they were like, you're a big lightsaber fan, aren't you, punk? <laughs> I gotta say, though, if you ever have the chance, just go down that Wikipedia uh, rabbit hole. It's really fun. Are there any, like, the, like, Hitler Wikipedia game for Wikipedia? (laughs) All roads lead to Ben Kenobi. My favorite one that I ever saw on Wikipedia is that if you continually click the first link that isn't, like, a pronunciation link, 
uh, you'll eventually get to the philosophy page. Hmm. Really? And, and then the philosophy page, once you get there, then it's, if you keep doing the first link, then it's just a loop between a few articles that always gets you back to the philosophy page. Weird. There was one Wikipedia page. I kept doing random and then playing this game when I was mm. bored one day. And the only <laughs> one that I ever found, and I never, I didn't like write it down, but it was like uh, an article on an Irish town. <laughs> and, I, and I just got in this weird loop about Irish culture that never got to philosophy. But most of the time it works. I mean, once you end up on one you've seen before, you're like, well, I'm not going to get there then. Also that. Once you get, yeah, most of the time you get to like something like science and then... I'm like, oh, this is part of the philosophy loop. <laughs> so. Okay. Okay. Well. Moving on. I think the only thing we have that has enough substance for us to talk about for an extended period of time is the Myers-Briggs. I agree. And that's the one that I want to talk about the most. Quick overview for those of you listening. Right now we're at 22 subscribers in case everyone's anyone's interested. No, I'm interested. Recording. That blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, How many of those do you think are bots? Um, I don't know. Probably half. I don't have a good way to tell. But so the Myers-Briggs test, there are 16 personality types based on four categories, each of which has two options. On the official Myers-Briggs site, they denote them as your favorite world which is either extroversion or introversion, how you take in information, which is sensing or intuition, uh, making decisions is thinking or feeling, and structure in your life is judging or perceiving. We all took this quiz. We all took the same one, right? Yeah, yeah, we all took the same which one. Which one did we take? Humanmetrics.com. Humanmetrics. That's Shameless plug. Yeah, it'll be in the show notes. However, I think the best <laughs> website work. that goes in depth about them is 16personalities.com, which I will also link to in the show notes. But it has, ten, I guess, nine accessible sec sections from like intro, strengths and weaknesses, friendships, career paths, things like that. Yeah, so basically, when you take this test, you get a series of four letters. And like Mark said... You know, you have two options for each letter. In my case, I took the test and I got INTJ. So that stands for introverted, intuitive, thinking, and judging. And I gotta say, like, if you, if you read the description of INTJ, like, the kind of person that you are, uh, it, to me, it was kind of creepy because it's very accurate to a point that makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Mine was so accurate about me, too. Like, it, like, mentioned things that I didn't even think about myself, and then I thought about them. And I was like, wow, how did they do that? Real quick, what'd you get again, Jack? Uh, I got ENFJ, extroverted, intuitive, feeling, and judging. But as a quick qualifier on that, it gives you a preference percentage that shows how much you prefer that given letter over the alternative. So, um, for instance, um, on my intuitive label, it's with a 28% preference. Blah. Preference. <laughs> um, but that is also the highest percent preference that I have out of my four, getting as low as 1% for judging over thinking. It's judging over perceiving. Oh, judging over perceiving. Yeah, you're right. But that kind of, at least in my mind not takes credibility away from this, but it's kind of tough. You end up fence sitting on a lot of the questions and it makes it tough to get a super accurate result, which is why it's surprising that it still lines up really, really well, usually with how you see yourself. Yeah. I need to read Mikhail's. So Mikhail, <laughs> you said you're an INTJ? Yeah, and um, just to go over that, I, I forgot about the percentages, but actually mine are a lot higher for example, uh, <laughs> introvert is 59%. Um, intuitive, I have 38%. Thinking is 50 and judging is 28 Jeez. That's good. Well, good, I don't know, but... it That just seems... means you don't self-contradict. 
<laughs> Which, you know, I, I'm pretty sure is mentioned in the INTJ description. Oh, one of my favorite um, things from the description of the INTJ is that many INTJs do not readily grasp the social rituals. For instance, they have little... They tend to have little patience and less understandings of such things as small talk and flirtation. Well, for you guys who know me, you think that's a pretty accurate description? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I'm reading this and laughing pretty hard about how much it is you, Mikhail. Oh, yeah? I like it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you were um, ENFJ? ENFJ. They describe mm. us as the benevolent pedagogues of humanity. <laughs> yeah, 16 Personalities has the title as the protagonist. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course they do. Of course. I mean, of course. <laughs> we see the big picture. Our focus is expansive. What does that even mean? Full of passion and charisma. Yeah, I see that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh have tremendous power to manipulate others with their phenomenal interpersonal skills and unique salesmanship, but it's usually not meant as manipulation. I, they generally believe in their dreams and see themselves as helpers and enablers, which they usually are. Do you guys find me a helper or enabler or a manipulator? All, <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> all of the above? Yeah. Brutal. <laughs> Jack, if there's anybody who can make somebody laugh at something that isn't funny, it's you. That's true. That is pretty manipulative. That's Which, pretty it, but they, then again, people. it's like not malicious man, manipulation. <laughs> That's true. All right, Mark. Yes. What are you? So denying all probability, I am also an INTJ. What? Yeah. Incredible. Huh. That also does not surprise me. When I was reading it, I was kind of thinking about you too, Mark. Well, thanks. So on the sixteen personality site, and I and they list this other word the the proportions of these personalities in the population. Um, so INTJs are about two percent of the population, which is about a third of what you would expect if they were kind of evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, which I think is interesting. Women are far less likely to have the INTJ um, personality type. I think this is what's an important thing with these sorts of personality tests is that Mikhail and I are obviously very different people, but we still display these similar traits, but kind of through different means. Yeah, I see that. Uh. Yeah, I'm reading through it, and it kind of reminds me of a horoscope in a way because you can kind of read into it a little bit. Obviously, uh -huh. not True. as much. Definitely not as much as a horoscope, but... Like, yeah, now I'm, I'm reading this from Mark's perspective, and yeah, it, it does describe him pretty well. And I think what you said is super important, that at least these things, they make more of a direct stance, you know? You um, mean than a horoscope? Than a horoscope. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, there's they're using a bit more explicit language, uh, you know, less ambiguous terms to kind of describe what's going on. Where, you know, like, yeah, there are some aspects where, like, you could potentially be like, oh, Jack, you're a little bit like this, but they're not kind of the dominating traits that are shown. That's fair. So something that I would want to know about these personality tests is how likely is it that somebody would change their letters over their lifetime? I think it depends on the person. Like, if we're looking at you, Mikhail, and the percentages that you read off, I don't remember mine because I took this a bit ago. Um, but, you know, you were over 50% on almost all of them, right? No. No, it was uh, 59, 38, 50, and 28. Oh, 38 is one that you said. Okay. Well, you were over 25 on all of them then? Yeah. Okay. Which is still pretty high, I think, as far as these sorts mm. of things go. And the test was like 65 questions. Yeah. Um, so if they're at that margin, I would say that you're very unlikely to change. Versus Jack, you know, depending on the mood you're in, when you if you were to take this again, true, you might think about a you know, answering a little no with a big no, 
or you know saying uncertain for a couple more might might totally change my answer yeah yeah i agree so i think that it's possible um but not to some extreme way i would True. imagine i agree i just found the distribution and i am four percent of the population mm -hmm. makes me feel special so where where did you find yours because i found a different percentage mm. I was on some random site. Yeah, I mean, I'm on the actual myersbriggs.org. <laughs> and it's just, how frequent is my type? So ENFJ is 2.5%. Mm. INTJ is 2.1%. So not uh, quite the rarest. Looks like the rarest is INFJ, which is about 1.5%. Let's see who they are. J, the advocate. INFJs tend to see helping others as their purpose in life. Uh, but while people with this personality type can be found engaging rescue efforts and doing charity work, their real passion is to get to the heart of the issue so that people need not be rescued at all. Aww. Yeah. That's why the world's such a bad place, everyone. It's because there's not enough advocates. Exactly. What is the most common, or most? what are the most common types? Uh, the most kind of couple common that are way above what you'd expect, like almost twice as frequent, is ISFJ. ISFJ. The Defender. The Defender. Ooh. Which is, oh, yeah, so if you go to the 16 personality types, each um, of the combinations of letters have their own, like, little title. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Mikhail and I are the architect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So yes, ISFJ and ESFJ are both very common, and so is ISTJ. So the logistician, the defender, and the consul are the most common. It's interesting how they find a way to make every personality a positive. I think it would be bad if they tried to... Demonize people? Well, because the thing is that every personality trait can be positive true because that that's the thing is we're talking about traits not actions traits of a person so yeah. how yeah. they choose to use that personality is a totally yeah. different thing on the architect type which is what Mikhail and i are the intjs um it, so people will often type tv characters or movie characters and villains are very very often intjs <laughs> you know, quit evil laughing because they often come off as this either you know somewhat antisocial kind of playing games of chess with the world almost like that's how they view the world mm. is as a very rational planned out way of doing things which isn't necessarily a bad thing you know like i definitely run many parts of my life that way but obviously I don't do it to some, you know, negative end as far as anyone knows. <laughs> you know, I, I think maybe a good point to bring up here is that Mark and I are both doing um, an experiment this semester, which uh, is we are tracking our time. Jack, have I told you about this? Oh, yes, but please explain it to everybody. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Almost exasperated. <laughs> that wasn't intended to be exasperated. I don't know why it came off that way. Please explain. I do find this very interesting. I'm excited to see what you guys actually find at the end. Yeah. Uh, so basically, what, we, what we're doing is that as soon as we wake up, we start a timer. So this timer has a bunch of different categories. So um, for mine, like I wake up and then I go to the bathroom. So that's the timer that I start. And then um, if I'm going to be eating then I turn on my meal time timer or have different timers for like when I'm going from place to place or doing homework you know all that kind of stuff so basically mm -hmm. as long as I'm awake I'm on the clock yep yeah I've been compiling some of the data so far which is interesting to look at so uh, just kind of like on a weekly basis so each week I look at how much time did I spend doing certain activities. What I found really interesting is that um, I'm spending about as much time going from place to place as I do sitting in class. 
Really? Yeah, around like 15 hours a week. Wow. I feel like that's probably about consistent with mine that I spend somewhere in the 10 to 15 hour range just in transit. Mm -hmm. Sounds about right. Yeah, and it's actually really interesting that, well, it, it makes complete sense that I am spending about 15 hours a week in class because I'm taking 15 credits this semester. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Uh huh. Incredible. <laughs> yeah, so I'm really interested to um, start actually um, taking a look at this more in depth once the semester is over because I feel once finals are done, I'm going to stop the doing the timers, but it's been interesting, like, uh, looking at this, there's, like, some that are pretty consistent week to week. There's some that vary wildly. Uh, a couple of my classes are, you know, sometimes I don't spend any time doing homework for that class one week, but then I'll spend, like, a lot of time another week. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's interesting. Anyway, w probably more on that later. <laughs> Once you have time to analyze. Yes. Yeah. And and I think that, you know, I, I'm sure where you are kind of getting at is that seems to be consistent with the personality type that we have, where, you know, this is something that we're doing to try and, I guess, kind of take control in a logical way of how we kind of use our time. Yeah, Because exactly. it's like, oh, this is a small thing that we can do with potentially very good benefits and it's just kind of a rational you know return on investment sort of a thing to engage in exactly i just one more thing about this is that yes i'm gonna have a lot of fun looking at the data once i'm done but i found it's really helped me um sort of focus this semester because well just out of you know sheer laziness i don't want to be pulling my phone out and changing which timer i'm on you know uh, you know, like every couple of couple times a minute or something like that. So I've been able to develop this mindset where if I start a timer, then I tell myself that's what I'm doing right now. So like if mm -hmm. I'm going to be working on this homework, I'm not going to be checking my phone. I'm not going to like go get a snack or anything. I'm working on this right now. It's really helped me compartmentalize like my my energy. Yeah, it's actually awesome. And that was a big thing for me where... In the past, I've had a lot of trouble kind of compartmentalizing all that stuff. And that I know that it'd be good for me because so many times I'll find myself lying awake or distracted when I'm with other people just thinking about a problem or, you know, or the reverse, obviously, if I'm working on homework and distracted by other stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of made a conscious effort to be like, okay, no, I'm going to do better at this. And this was before, our, you know, I kind of talked with Mikhail and was like, oh, I'll just start tracking my time um, on a mm. whim is basically how it <laughs> happened. Yeah, it was over uh, lunch. You just downloaded the app and started. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mikhail was like, I really wish I had someone to compare this data with. And I was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> no skin um, off my bones. I can do that yeah. right now. But it just kind of it, it fit in pretty naturally into what I was already trying to do. But now it, you know, it makes it a lot easier to keep doing that. If anybody out there is listening and wants to try this, um, the app that I would recommend, which is for iOS, is called Hours. And it is a, an app you can um, pay for it, but you don't have to, which I find really nice. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark, uh, which one do you use? <laughs> uh, I use Android, and I use A Time Logger, which is just, it has, you know, the features are slightly different than Mikhail's. The interface is a little different, but it does pretty much the same stuff. Um, I like that you can pretty easily personalize stuff, and it, I, as far as I know, it's completely free. So I haven't had to pay anything for it. I like these sorts of tests because they help me think about the way that I work and the environments that I work in and the sort of things that I would like to do in the future and helps me kind of give words and reasons to why I kind of sort of think, why I think that way or act the way that I do. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a, um, just kind of confirmation of ways that I kind of already think about myself, but can't necessarily vocalize the way that I want to. Mm -hmm. And I find that I personally find that really helpful. I found that really, really helpful freshman year with the Gallup's Strength Finder, which is another 
personality type thing that I actually take a bit more stock in than the uh, Myers Briggs. It's it's also doing different, slightly different stuff, but uh, like I thought that was really helpful for me um, in thinking about how I work. So I was wondering for you guys if you how much you buy into this sort of stuff and if you can think of ways that it could help you or if you're just kind of like ah, it's cute you know like where do you kind of stand on that so where do we stand just on the usefulness of these sorts of things like do they matter are they are they useful are they real or is it more just a curiosity like a buzzfeed test <laughs> comparing it to a buzzfeed test well ruthless you can <laughs> yeah i mean you can i think it can be a great way if it's accurate mm -hmm. which can obviously be up in the air a little bit but typically they're pretty accurate it's kind of a good way to keep stock of your strengths because it's great at telling you what you are good at and when you read the description that you get after your test odds are the strengths will be pretty accurate. And sometimes, like, doing this helped me kind of, like, remember, oh, yeah, this is kind of, like, I'd kind of lost track of, like, how I work best, sort of. I don't know. Mm -hmm. When you have more and more stuff going on, it's tough to always be as efficient as you want to be and do things the way that you want. Sometimes life gets in the way a little bit. So, I don't know. I think it's nice I don't think it's going to change your life by any means to take one of these tests. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'll get any surprises, really. But I don't know. Mikhail, what do you think? It's really important to know stuff about yourself. Like he mentioned, you know, how do you work best? Well, I guess for an example, we have a mutual friend who is able to do homework while watching a TV show, and somehow he's able to absorb like what's happening in the TV show and get his work done. I find it incredibly distracting if there's, you know, some sort of visual stimulus going on in my environment. So like even, you know, just trying to study in like the physics building, there's this one table that's like kind of near a hallway and I try not to sit there, but sometimes it's the only place open. Anyway, when I'm sitting there, I just get distracted because there's people walking back and forth all the time um also or auditory stimulus i find distracting and i'm really glad that i know these things about myself because um i know that there's certain types of work that i can do in certain environments you know like if i'm out on campus then you know sometimes i can't find a quiet place and i know you know this probably isn't a good time for me to try to do you know, maybe my electrodynamics homework, which I need a lot of focus in order to make any sort of progress. Yeah, just knowing stuff about yourself is good. I don't know necessarily whether or not the Myers-Briggs will give you that specific insight, but it might be a stepping stone. But I do think it can change your life, maybe not in like the you know grand or monumental way that people usually think about, you know, a life-changing event. But, you know, it it's an integral little step in the, <laughs> in the right direction. I agree. Yay. <laughs> All right. For, one, for once, it's not Mark and I ganging up on you during a discussion. We're all just talking. Exactly. Right? Which is funny because based on this test, you'd think it'd be you guys against me. Ho, ho, ho. I remember with the strengths test, the one that, like, kind of resonated with me is that I have input as one of my strengths. And one trait of people who have input is that you tend to hoard information. So, like, you don't get rid of old class notes. <laughs> and I'm like, yep, totally me. Like, I still have my notes from AP Euro and A Push. Uh, the other day I was, like, I, I'll type up my old math notes before I get rid of the paper copies. Oh. Um, I should count. Right now I have a folder with 45 math textbooks. What? In PDF form. Oh, okay. It's about half a gigabyte. 
how often do you look at those older textbooks? Oh, these are textbooks that I have not even looked at yet, but have at some uh, at some point want to read or will be potentially useful in the future. Jeez, that's awesome. I do something similar uh, with audiobooks. Of course you do. Well, uh, okay, so I guess I also have a folder, except instead of being it being filled with a bunch of textbooks, it's filled with a bunch of public domain audiobooks mm-hmm. uh, or just, you know, stuff I've gotten for free because of trial memberships and all that good sure. stuff. Yeah, so I have a folder of that, and it's... You know, it's somewhere around 50 audiobooks. I have no idea when I'll ever be able to listen to all of them. But it's comforting to know that, you know, they're there. Yeah. If I need them. <laughs> my apps also speak to this on my phone. I found an app called LibriVox. L-I-B-R-I-V-O-X. Which is just an entire repository of public domain audiobooks. Really? Yeah. How did you spell that again? L I B R I V O X. Um, but I think that that also fits in with like the Myers Briggs type for me. I don't know. It feels like almost um, like, of course, I'll keep all of this information that I have gathered. You know, why would I ever want to get rid of this stuff? You know, it's information, it's useful. Uh-huh. Um, potentially. But it, it costs. You know, almost nothing to just keep it, you know, and if I need it, then it's there. For those of you who are interested, yes, um, LibriVox, or however you pronounce it, it is available (laughs) for iOS. There you go. Mikhail has convinced me to begin listening to The Fellowship of the Ring via audiobook. It's a boring, boring book. (laughs) Except for when he sings. Except for when he sings, which he's only done once so far. Oh, dude, you are in for a treat because uh, do you, I forget who the who the guy um, do you know who reads it? No, no idea. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> so this guy, you know what? I'm gonna find out actually. Um, but in the meantime, so the guy who reads it, he, uh, well, for those of you who don't know, there are a lot of songs in that in those books, and of course, like you can't hear them they're just written lyrics but the sad part is most of them didn't make it into the movies so if that's all you're familiar with like you probably probably don't know that there's a lot of songs but in the audiobook version that i gave to jack uh the guy who reads it which okay shoot um give me like 30 seconds here (laughs) Real quick, I'm going to put a plug in for my own audiobook that I, not mine, obviously, but The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, narrated by Stephen Fry. Definitely the most entertaining audiobook I've ever listened to. That's awesome. First of all, just a really funny book. Anyone who reads it would make it funny, but this British guy reading it, oh, so perfect. So there's my plug. Was it on LibriVox? Ah, uh, probably not. I have it on Scribd. The heck is what was that word you just said? Scribd. Yeah, S C R I B D. It's like a file sharing service online, but also has books and audio books and sheet music. It's a subscription service. It's like nine bucks a month or something. For me, totally worth it. There's so much sheet music on it, and if it's in document form, like someone just scanned it in, then I can just download it to a PDF on my computer. That's true. And hmm. same with like textbooks that I found on there and stuff. Oh. So good and so legal, obviously. Oh, anyway, so I found it. So the Lord of the Rings trilogy version that um, Jack, and, well, I listened to and now Jack's in the middle of. It's narrated by a man named Robert Inglis. And what I love about um, how he narrates this is he actually took the time to figure out how to sing all of the songs. And I'm not as sure if Tolkien wrote down melodies for this, but... Um, it's not in the books. Anyway, he does a really good job of singing it, and he sings in different, you know, the voices of the characters who are supposed to be singing. It's pretty great. Hmm. Also, it was just so nice, because honestly, that's probably the only way that I could actually get 
through the entirety of of the Lord of the Rings trilogy because like Jack said, the first book is is actually pretty boring for most of it. <laughs> Have you ever read the actual books, Mikhail? I tried. I got oh. somewhere like maybe a third of the way into the Fellowship of the Ring. And I got so bored, I, I just couldn't oh. go any further. Have you read all of them, Mark? Yeah, in sixth grade and seventh grade. Because at that point, my mom decided that I was old enough to watch the movies. Mm-hmm. Um, so of course. back when Hollywood Video was a thing, or like Blockbuster... For those of you, I don't know. I don't actually know how widespread Hollywood video was, but that was, <laughs> it was right by my house. True. Um, but it was read a book, go get the movie, read the next book, watch the next movie for all three. I enjoyed it. I might do that with the audiobooks. I might, yeah. after I finish the first movie, go see the movie or find a way to watch it. However, I never finished The Hobbit. Really? Oh, I actually really like The Hobbit. Oh, it's much I'm shorter sure than I the would. other ones. I know, but like it was assigned in Vision Twenty One in like fifth grade, and you know the difference between like fifth and like late sixth grade is a big difference. So like in fifth grade, where it was like this is required reading and all this stuff, mm-hmm. made it really hard to finish it on time. So I, I read most of it, but I never finished it. Okay. But sixth grade, it was like, well, I kind of read some of The Hobbit. Let's just read the actual this whole trilogy, and it's going to be just for me, and it was wonderful. <laughs> that's wonderful yeah i like that hey while we're going down the lord of the rings rabbit hole oh man uh, well i just wanted to make a oh, comparison geez. because i gotta say i liked the book version of the hobbit so much better than the movie version but i also liked the movie version of the lord of the rings trilogy better than the book version what do you guys think what i was gonna say just to put in how much exposure i have to the lord of the rings i have seen all of the movies and read the Hobbit multiple times. And when I tried to read the Lord of the Rings books the first time, I read all of the fellowship of the ring and got halfway through the two towers. And then just, they described Gimli stepping on a leaf for like a page and a half. And I just gave up. I just remember I put it down. I never touched it again. <laughs> <laughs> You're weak. Weak. So, Get out of here. <laughs> what is the book still sitting on your coffee table or something? No. I just never opened it again. Oh, okay. I think the last time that my copy of that book was opened was like at least 12 years ago when oh. I tried to read it. Oh, my. Yeah, that was the issue. I was in like elementary school. Oh, yeah, that that's is an too issue. young. <laughs> that's way too young. I think young. I was like eight or nine. Man. It wasn't above my reading level by any means. I just, did, I just got so bored. Yeah. <laughs> it was okay. just so long. Can, we, can anyway. we acknowledge that there's a huge difference between reading level and age-appropriate material? Mm, you're right. And age-appropriate writing style. Oh, yeah. True. Style and, yeah, material. I, I guess I'm not even talking about, like, you know, raunchy stuff or violent things, but, like, there's just some, like, subjects that just aren't interesting to young kids. Can confirm. Yeah, I mean, for me, I didn't watch the Hobbit movies just because I heard so many bad reviews and the fact that it wasn't actually really relaying the story of The Hobbit very accurately at all. Um, <laughs> I never felt the need to go and watch it. Because I have this weird thing with movies where, like, if it's based on a book, especially a book that I've read, like, I'm super, super critical. And I can't really suspend my disbelief. But other things, like, especially the Avengers movies, which to me are objectively really bad movies as far as the plot lines go, but because they're not based on anything that I'm actually invested in, I can just be like, let's just, let's just enjoy the raw entertainment value of this. Fair. Um, That's how it was with The Hobbit. Yeah. Saw it in theaters. Okay. It was wonderful. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I could bring myself to that, but like, I don't know. (laughs) I, I generally like books more than movies there's something about the focus that goes into reading a book that makes it more enjoyable i get more lost in the wor- in the world versus in a movie there are more things distracting me i guess in a different way mm-hmm. um, that makes it sometimes harder for me and there are very few movies that have really captured me the only ones that i can really think of are like forrest gump and goodwill hunting are the two where I can like sit through and just really get engaged in the story itself and what's going on. 
But so much of the Lord of the Rings, like you just mentioned, Jack, that you didn't like at the time was, you know, Tolkien's writing style. That's fair. Very drawn out. But, like, that is part of the story that, like, obviously doesn't get shown in the movie. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a big difference. Yeah, I think I see what you're saying is, and just to mention it, is that the reason why I, you know, actually found enjoyment in The Hobbit is probably, be well, the movies, is because mm-hmm. I just like the franchise so much, which I guess is, you know, the reason why I really like all the Marvel superhero movies, because, I you know, I just get really excited about it. Um, you know, it's like another superhero thing, or, it's, you know, it's like another Lord of the Rings kind of thing. But I definitely get what you're saying about the books because, well, I think it's true for audiobooks too because um, the especially the Lord of the Rings trilogy that is a really long audiobook. Painfully so. It's so long. I'm not looking forward to how long it's going to take me to get through the entire first book. Uh, okay. Well, I think <laughs> I don't know. You might be taking the wrong approach there. I found it really nice because it was just a way for me to fill like the space. And so that's what I spent most of um, my sophomore year um, in like the in-between times, which I guess, so like I listen to it, you know, when I'm on the train. 10 to 15 or, hours a week. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <You> got it. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would listen to it like when I'm on the train or like when I'm making dinner, or, you know, stuff like that. And it was just nice because it was, I got to go really deep into it. And so I think whenever I think back on like sophomore year, there's always this like slight, um, it's like slightly colored in, you know, the, the Lord of the Rings universe, because that was, you know, where my mind was a lot of the time. That makes sense. But then again, yeah. So after that, that's when I got into podcasts and audiobooks Mm -hmm. really heavily because I found it was great to have something to, you know, hold my attention in those in-between times because before I was just listening to music and, you know, that doesn't hold my attention as much. Okay. I'm going to bring us back to nowhere. I'm going to have us take the surprise quiz in the show notes. Oh, yeah. I forgot about the surprise quiz. Uh, what Mark has done here is he uh, he put a link in the show notes and the link just says, surprise, don't peek. No, still don't peek. Still don't peek. I'm just going to read it to you. Oh. I, I'm oh, already okay. on the website. I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. You told me to go to it. Uh, I did not. Well, that's okay, Jack. You can follow along. I guess, Mikhail, at this point, you can do it too. Okay. But I'll still read it. Okay. Just because that's good. So the title is, Are You an Outdoors Person? An Indoors Person? A Sometimes Indoors, Sometimes Outdoors Person? A Person Who Doesn't Like to Pigeonhole Themselves as an Outdoors Person or an Indoors Person? Or... Just a regular person who doesn't like to play games, and sometimes, when angered, means serious business. And that was all one question. (laughs) Which of these are you? It's a personality test. We're trying to stay consistent. Mm Mm-hmm. Okie doke. Uh, Pick a movie genre. We have... Well, I'm not going to read them all. Or should I? I feel like I shouldn't. I'm just going to read the last one because it's long, and the long ones are always funny. A uh, psychological thriller with mysterious but ultimately ambiguous events where it's unclear whether or not said events have a rational explanation rooted in reality as we understand it, or are, in fact, events whose origin lies in the realm of the supernatural, but the movie doesn't bias the viewer against any one particular interpretation so that each individual can, viewer can draw his or her own conclusions. Oh. <laughs> I am going to pick... A psychological thriller with no supernatural elements as my movie genre. Pick a movie genre. I do like that. A regular movie for regular people? What do you want from me, (laughs) Clickhole? What does that mean? Other options are adventure, romance, adventure with a strong romantic subplot, (laughs) and also a psychological thriller with supernatural elements. And the long one. Yeah, so I guess I am just reading them. Might as well. What's your pick, Jack? Almost their point. I think I am also going to do the psychological thriller with no supernatural elements. Okay. Mikhail? You know, I'm definitely going to go with psychological thriller with mysterious, but ultimately ambiguous events where it's unclear whether or not said events have rational explanation rooted in reality as we understand it, or 
are, in fact, events whose origin lies in the realm of the supernatural, but the movie doesn't bias the viewer against any one particular interpretation <laughs> so that each individual viewer can draw his or her own conclusions. There you Jeez. go. All right, moving on to question two. Yes. What is your ideal first date? A night in front of the TV with a takeout dinner. A wild night out on the town, capped off with a passionate kiss. A night on the town, but nothing too out of control, like we go to a bunch of different places and really experience life, but we do it tastefully and with reserve. A walk in the park, then dinner, then a movie, then back to the park, and then the zoo. Jeez, after <laughs> dinner, a movie, a park, <laughs> and the zoo? Staring, oh. at each, staring at each other in silence from opposite sides of a big <laughs> windowless room. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> A normal meeting at night. What? Or a night spent reading to each other out loud from our favorite novels, first in front of a roaring fire and then outside in a rainstorm. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, so I found this quiz and I read the title and I loved it, but I haven't actually read any of the questions, so I wasn't prepared for any of these. This is great. Ah, oh, man. Okay, what, what are your guys' picks? What's your ideal first date? I really like a walk in the park, then dinner, then a movie, then back to the park, and then the zoo. Because okay. <laughs> I don't know how many hours they have in their day, but that seems pretty unreasonable to me. <laughs> go ahead, then. <laughs> um, Mikhail? You know, I gotta go with the, that same option, because, you know, I really <laughs> like the zoo. Fair enough. What about the animal cruelty that happens, Shh. Mikhail? I'm going to say a Just night on the town, but nothing too out of control. Like, <laughs> we go to a bunch of different places and really experience life, but we do it tastefully and with reserve. That sounds pretty good to me. All right, so for question three, I have an idea. What if we just oh, no. alternate people reading off the options? But I agree. But there's not a divisible by three number of options. Okay, I'll read the question, then the next person reads the next thing, so then it is a divisible by three number of things to right. read. Wait, no, actually, I got I got this. All right, so how, how it'll go, it'll go, it'll go Mark, <laughs> then me, then Jack, then me, then Mark, then Jack, then Jack again, then Mark. No, then we're not snaking me. this. We're not snaking this. <laughs> it's not a snake draft. <laughs> no, Michaela, okay, you fine. read the question, and then I'll go next, and then Jack, and then repeat. Okay. All right, so question number three. What is your most valuable character trait? My willingness to take risks. My ability to stay calm. Even when things get tense. My ability to notice the subtle body language that betrays the inner turmoil of a friend or co-worker who, by all outward appearances, is happy and content. Jeez, dark. <laughs> My willingness to take calculated risks such that I never act recklessly, but will often make decisions that could, potentially, have undesirable consequences, but which, when all probable outcomes are carefully assessed have a greater chance of panning out advantageously. My ability to swim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Mikhail? <laughs> okay. My ability to swim. <laughs> kind of valuable character trait. <laughs> yep. I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, my ability to enjoy myself in both outdoor and indoor environments. My regular feelings. Aww. How's it a character trait? I know, but neither is my ability to swim. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that last one is the option that an alien would pick when he's trying to <laughs> be human. Or the, or the second to last one. I like my ability to enjoy myself in both outdoor and indoor environments. <laughs> The phrasing is just slightly not right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like slightly weird and sociopath sounding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm going to say my ability to stay calm, even when things get tense. I'm going to pick up my willingness to take calculated risks such that I never <laughs> act recklessly, but will often make decisions that could potentially have undesirable consequences. But? But which, when <laughs> all probable outcomes are carefully assessed, have a greater chance of panning out advantageously. Because I like that that's like, I'm a risk taker, but I'm not really a risk taker, that's but right. I take risks. <laughs> exactly. What could be perceived as a risk? <laughs> <laughs> to the careful observer. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to go with my ability to swim. I knew you would. Good. I appreciate it. 
That's what I see in you, Mikhail. Did you? Which one did you pick, Mark? Did you pick outdoor and indoor environments? No, I picked my ability to stay calm even when things get tense. Okay, that's good. That's actually pretty valid about you. Yeah. So we're gonna have to paint some word pictures here. Pick a Harry Potter character. <laughs> All right. So the first picture is Harry Potter, but like I think from maybe from the Goblet of Fire. From the yeah, Goblet, okay, of, Fire, Goblet probably, of Fire. Yeah. Yeah. He's got like his his dirty raincoat on. Yeah. Does he have the long hair too? Get yeah. hippie. Get a haircut, Radcliffe. <laughs> and then Hermione looks like I don't. I'm not gonna try and guess which movie. It was easy with Harry. It's not well, as easy later. It's it's one of the later ones, clearly. Yeah, that's I I guess, sure. And then we have Ron. I'm gonna guess from like, probably Prisoner of Azkaban, Goblet of Fire. But I don't <laughs> think Goblet of Fire because after Goblet of Fire, everyone's kind of seen some shit. True. You know, <laughs> shit gets dark. Yep. Yeah. Gets real dark. Yeah. Um, and then, oh, and then <laughs> this is this is Michael Gambone. Yeah, they have both Dumbledores. First yeah. they have new Dumbledore. Yes, Michael Gambone, who played him, and then Richard Harris. The one true He's... Dumbledore. Yeah, whatever. I don't know, I kind of like Michael... I like I like new Dumbledore better than old Dumbledore, personally. I do, too. Fine. Um, so the next one is a circle, and it's got two dots in there, and a line. Kind of looks like a face. Often called a straight face emoji. And then we have a... Uh, a three-panel picture of young Hermione from probably Chamber of Secrets, um, Dobby... Looking distressed. And, yes, looking distressed, and the risen Voldemort looking angry. <laughs> <laughs> that was that one character? Um, I think that all three of them are embodied in someone. I don't know who yet. I'm thinking about it. Anyway... Lastly, Hagrid watching Buckbeak die. <laughs> <laughs> what? No. <laughs> no. No, I don't think so. <laughs> he's looking pretty somber. I don't think he's he that somber. He looks more contemplative, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Oh, fine. Shot down by the INTJs. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, those of us who totally understand uh, body language and what people look like. <laughs> uh, okay, who do you all pick? I pick new Dumbledore. You pick new, new Dumbledore? I'm going to pick Ron. I love Ron. Ron's so lame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going with the one true Dumbledore. Okay. Uh, now, to a somewhat relevant question. Question number five. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> How do you feel about camping? I love it. I hate it. I love camping the word, but hate camping the activity. <laughs> 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 I don't understand. I neither love nor hate camping. It is something I have done in the past and enjoyed, and might want to do again, but it is something that I would like to do all the time. Not something. It is. Oh, sorry. It is not something that I would like to do all the time. Jack? <laughs> I feel the normal way about camping. I feel the regular way about camping. <laughs> I love camping and not camping. I'm picking I love it. Uh, I am also going to go with I love it. I'm going to say neither love nor hate. I have done it in the past and enjoyed it. I may want to do it again, but it's not something I want to do all the time. Okay. All right. Last question. Number six. Someone asks if you want to go outdoors. What do you say? <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was cute. No. Sometimes I say yes. Sometimes I say no. I say yes and no at the same time. <laughs> Keeping us in suspense? Yeah. <laughs> um, I say yes, but then I don't go outside. <laughs> <laughs> I say no, but then I do go outside. I do regular business. I don't move. This is a tough question. It is. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I sometimes say yes, and sometimes I say no. I'm picking that as well. Sometimes <laughs> I say yes. Answer. I'm going with I do regular business. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get results. Oh, jeez. <laughs> nice. All right. You're an outdoors person. You love going outdoors, <laughs> being outdoors, staying outdoors, and camping. 
you love living life to the fullest and being outdoors. Uh, I'm a person who doesn't like to pigeonhole themselves as an oh, outdoors person here, or Mark. as an indoors person. Yes. Incredible. Uh, you're a person that doesn't like to pigeonhole themselves. You like being indoors, but that doesn't mean you want to be indoors forever because you also like being outdoors. You hate it when someone tries to label you as just an outdoors person or just an indoors person. Labels can't define you. Indoors and outdoors are both fine with you. Good work. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that was good. I liked that a lot. Mikhail, did did you take introvert, extrovert, or a sea monster? Oh, no, I haven't. Oh, my. All right, so question number one. What is your signature look? Bright and flashy. Muted and professional. A rippling shadow below the surface. Oh, God. Mm. <laughs> so foreboding. In the workplace, you... Seek out new responsibilities with gusto. Wait to be assigned tasks. Weave silently through the inky blackness. When you've got a new crush, you... Make the first move. Somebody's got to. Wait for your crush to say something. You don't want to embarrass yourself. Conceal yourself behind a sunken freighter and wait. You've been waiting at the DMV for more than an hour and they haven't called your number. You... Storm up and get their attention. They've obviously made a mistake. Hang tight. They'll get to you eventually. Live undisturbed for decades in a secluded cove, untouched by man or time. <laughs> On an average Friday night, you... Steaming up the dance floor until your friends drag you home. Cuddling up to Netflix with a bottle of wine brushing against the underside of a Portuguese fishing trawler. All right. Mikhail, what are you? I'm a sea monster. Oh, you're a sea monster. I'm a sea monster. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Whoa. What are the odds? Now, what do sea monsters do? You dwell within the ancient, undisturbed depths where light cannot reach, surfacing rarely a prehistoric beast from another time. Mankind has only begun to explore a fraction of Earth's oceans, but it is only a matter of time before you will have to make yourself known once more. Jeez. You guys know about the coelacanth? The what? The coelacanth. No? How do you spell that? C-O-E-L-A-C-A-N-T-H. Yep, One of the best fishes ever. Going in the show notes. <laughs> it's like a sea monster, but not quite a sea monster. But basically a sea monster. How big are they? Um, two meters. Six and a half feet, 200 pounds. 90 kilograms. I want to talk about the coelacanth real quick, based on question four on the quiz, because one of the options was live undisturbed for decades. The coelacanth was what was thought to be extinct forever and then they found one in like the early 1900s and they believe that it hasn't really evolved in about 400 million years really wow yeah like that's why that's why it's super cool and popular not because it's just kind of a weird looking thing like it just kind of one just kind of happened to surface in like the indian ocean randomly and someone found it and they're like oh yeah this is a really really old fish that we have found fossils of and hasn't really changed at all weird yeah, it's super cool. So there you go. There's our history lesson for the day. <laughs>